welcome everybody. Uh, this is a TDC virtual salon with Jason Pommental uh, doing better typography uh, and editorial design with variable fonts. So without further ado, here's Jason. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that so many people signed up and, and want to learn more about this. And I'm really happy that it's, it's been so accessible to so many people. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Jason Pommentel. I'm a graphic designer and web designer and typographer that have been, I've been working on the web for about 25 years. And about the past 10, I've been focusing in um, pretty specifically on better typography on the web. And then a few years ago when I saw uh, variable fonts get introduced to A-Type-I in, in Warsaw, Poland, um, my jaw just hit the floor because I, I could see right away that this was a format that would have a, a significant implication for the challenges that we face in implementing better typography on the web. So the first thing uh, that I'll do to sort of lay the groundwork is, um, is explain what variable fonts are. So I, I'm hoping that most of you have heard of them um, and if you do, uh, I just sort of like a couple of things worth, worth mentioning. Um, there's a chat window that will allow you to, to say stuff um, where you can, you can choose. Um, I just chose all panelists and attendees so I can write back to all of you at once. Um, uh, so if you have a comment or whatever, it's fine. Use that. Um, we do have a Q&A window um, that is easier for us to sort of track and then show which ones have been, been answered. Um, so, so if you have a question, feel free to submit it there. I'll have about 15 minutes at least at the end for us to uh, go through questions and answers. And, um, and I'm gonna leave the last bit of this a little bit more open. So, uh, so if there are questions, I can show you lots of specific things. But um, first, let's, let's talk about what a variable font is. And, excuse me. Um, previously, if you needed to use a font on your desktop, um, that's one file, it's one weight. Uh, if you wanted to install the whole family, you might be installing as many as 96 or 108 different files, depending on the number of widths and weights and variants that might be available. Um, the variable font format actually takes all of that and makes it available in a single file. Now we've had a couple of attempts at this in the past with TrueType GX and multiple masters and it, it didn't really go anywhere. Um, but this is a little different uh, because at the time we couldn't use them on the web and it's on the web where they became most immediately usable and solved a bunch of problems right away uh, that get in the way of better design on the web. So that single efficient file is much smaller than all of those separate ones. Now, how much smaller depends on the number of axes. So let's talk about what those axes are. What are the different kinds of variation that you might see? Well, here's Tristan and Tilly again. They'll be helping me make some, some explanations here. Um, there's also some links and things here. Um, I'll be making um, a link to these slides available. I apologize for not having it up already, but um, I'll make sure that we distribute it to the list of everybody who signed up. So you'll be able to reach these slides on the web and follow some of these links. But um, I wrote a guide for the Mozilla website about using variable fonts. And I also have another website that I'll show you that has a ton of information on it. But let's talk about these axes of variation. So something like a width axis, um, takes that whole continuum of extra condensed to extra wide and exposes it as that range of values expressed as a percentage inside a single file. And you also have weight. Um, now, normally this has been, generally it's one to a thousand if you look at the, at the open type specification and, and that's what variable fonts are. It is an evolution of open type. Um, 400 is supposed to be regular. That's the one thing that's stipulated about this um, in, the, in the spec. Everything else is kind of up for grabs, but generally speaking, in the past, we've had single 100 increment variants of 100 to 900, with typically 400 is regular and 700 is bold, and then everything else is kind of up for grabs. Um, but we can also have these custom axes. So X height, for example, 
um, that would allow you to play around with things. So uh, with something slightly narrower and smaller, increasing the X height could still help preserve some legibility. So it, you start to see all of these different permutations that you have at your disposal to make type that works better at a greater variety of sizes. And then also if you want to be more expressive, then you can get a little bit crazier with that too. So um, a wide high X height might give you a little bit more of um, sort of an, an art deco kind of feel um, or really cram the X height down and kind of change it and uh, kind of bring it back a little bit more. So there's, there's lots of different choices that you might have. Um, and you can also get things like italic and slant. So we don't want to miss out on, on any of these things. And, and slant is a separate axis from italic so that you can control the angle from the glyph substitution separately if you so choose. Now that's not always the case. So in this, in this case, what you see on the screen here, the word elegant is set in italic and it's either on or off. And what you'll notice is I'm also including code examples to show you how that is implemented in CSS. Now, most of what I've been showing you up to this point are what are referred to as, as the registered or standard axes, everything but X height. So they map to existing CSS properties, which makes it really handy when you want to build it into um, an existing project so that font weight is just font weight. You can give it a number now instead of just saying regular or bold. Same thing goes for font width, even though unfortunately, um, there were no type designers in the room when the W3C decided to name that axis, so they called it font stretch. Um, I apologize on the behalf of the web to all of you, but that's kind of what we're stuck with. But still, um, you have this axis. It could be, you know, starts at 100% for the normal width that can go as high as 1,000 or as low as 1 if you want. Um, express it as a percentage, and that's the CSS that you can use. Um, font style italic or font style oblique with some number of degrees will allow you to tap into either the italic or the slant axis. Um, that's probably one of the areas where there's still a lot of interesting things happening and experimentation um, with what happens when you leave something set to auto. So you could have a slant axis that shifts to italic once you get past a certain degree range. Um, so there's some interesting things going on there. Um, sometimes it's separated into a separate file and that will uh, kind of give you a little bit more uh, freedom on the web to conserve the data. Um, so I'm going to come back to that in a second, but that's really one of the things that has hampered our adoption of great typography on the web. Um, but I wanted to get to optical size because this is something, if you've been around graphic design and typography long enough, you'll realize that this concept actually dates back hundreds of years. The idea that at a physically smaller size, you might use a lower optical size value that corresponds to less stroke contrast and perhaps more open apertures or terminals to make that text more legible at a physically smaller size. And then at a larger size, you can go back to that higher contrast and finer detail because it will be more legible at that larger size. This was very common in metal type and oftentimes a six point would be cut very differently than a 72 point or even a 36 point. So this notion of optical sizing in a single typeface design is something that largely disappeared when we shifted to photo type setting, where they just basically shot one size and then scaled it. And the same thing held true with digital type until the advent of variable fonts. Um, that's not 100% true. There are a couple of people that have gone about making different optical size versions. And actually, if you look at Roll, uh, the latest release from Matthew Carter and Morisawa, um, that actually has separate file versions that correspond to different uh, usage sizes. And, and there are other foundries that have done that as well. They're certainly not the only ones. Um, the advantage to having it all in a single file is you can have it tailor for everything in between. So that optical size axis, you can leave set to auto and then whatever size you set the type, the browser will automatically pick the right point along that optical size axis. So that again, all of these things are aiming towards better legibility in a more automatic fashion when we're doing things on the web, all the while loading less data. 
So uh, here's just another example. And now um, I should pause here again and actually uh, let everybody know that what we're seeing here for the words optical size and then chapter one loomings and the body text is all set in the same font. It is the exact same file that is having the weight and the optical size axis pushed around a little bit to play around with the contrast of the strokes and obviously the weight of, of the text. So it can be very usable. Uh, this is a type, uh, typeface called Literata from Type Together. It was originally commissioned by Google for their ebook platform. And they just did a new release of it that if you go back to the source has all of this flexibility. And I'll show you this in a couple of other projects as well. It's a wonderful text typeface. Um, and I, I think you can uh, you could really go a long way with just that single typeface um, to have a pretty expressive um, range. Now, um, coming back again to why did we lose typography on the web? Um, and and I, I think I can say that as a pretty fair statement that um, for many, many years, um, arguably even till today, uh, there is not nearly enough attention paid to good typography on the web. Now that means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I'll start with using good typefaces and using them in a range um, uh, that gives you a distinct voice. So what tends to happen, um, because the, the biggest issue that we deal with on the web is how long does it take the web page to, to render? So even once we were able to technically use web fonts, most people decided to stay fairly constrained in what they would load or else it would take too long for the web page to show up. And according to Google's stats, after about three seconds, you've lost 50% of your audience because people don't want to wait around. Now that varies based on the purpose of the site. Some people are more patient than others, but generally speaking, if you want people to read your content or buy your products, if it takes longer than three seconds for the text to show up, then they're going to go away and they're going to go to your competitor. So that data download is a big deal. Um, so what tends to happen is people will load one or two weights and maybe one variant, and that's all they'll be using on their website. And that tends to a lot to, to lead to a very homogenous web. Um, until the advent of web fonts, it was just a sea of, of Arial and, and maybe Georgia, if you were lucky, um, if it was used well. But um, it tended to be a lot of sameness. And now, finally, we're, we're able to um, use web fonts. So that started about 10 years ago. Uh, but people were still concerned about the data download. So they tended to go to things that they knew and that were small and load few of them. So they might have a regular and a bold and an italic, and then maybe something else for a heading. And, and that would kind of be it. And when you have that single weight that you're using for bold text at every size, that can be either anemic when it's really big or really hard to read when it's very small. And, and you still have all these issues in between. So if you were in print, you might use five or six different weights and to use them based on which you know, the size at which you're setting the text. So this is something that was never really done on the web because of the performance problems. Now that we can eliminate that by only loading a single font file, we might load, so Literata, the one that I'm loading here is about 150K for the upright font file, which for web nerds might seem like a lot, but for the rest of us, who are thinking about the design variation that we can get out of this, that's instead of loading six or eight or 10 different weight and variant files that we might get from some static implementation. So we can be far more expressive. So we solve the data download problem and that lets us be more expressive with our typography. And the challenge then is to get all of, all of us that uh, might know something about typography but not be quite sure how to apply it on the web to sort of embrace this and know that it's here um, and encourage the people that we work with in developing websites to get to know them and, and to embrace them. And, and then if we're more web folks that might have less background in traditional typographic education, 
um, is to start to look at things and see, look at great print publication design and look at all the different thicknesses and widths and weights. Like look at a great newspaper, printed newspaper front page. And you'll probably see six or seven different text styles used to guide your eye around that page. Well, we don't do that on the web. Even if you look at the New York Times on the web, there might be three text styles. Um, maybe simplifying that a little bit, but not that much. So we've lost a lot of the hierarchy and meaning that we can infer from great typography because we've been chasing after the optimization side of things. So this lets us do a little bit of both. We just have to now embrace that and, and learn to do something well with it. So um, I wanted to show you a couple of things. Um, and uh, one of those is, uh, this is my own website. And the reason I wanted to show this to you is the text here, 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 it's all the same font. It's from David Jonathan Ross, uh, DJR, his font of the month club. This is Roslindale in the Italic, uh, the, uh, the variable version. And it has an, uh, an optical size and weight axis similar to what uh, I was using with Literata. And it allows me to do this big, beautiful display text with still very readable body text down below while only loading a single file. In this case, it's 63K. So it's a very tiny asset that loads very quickly that lets us do lots and lots. Um, some of the other sites that I'm going to show you, um, I'm gonna hold off on for the moment because it's gonna show you a bunch of things at once. And um, I wanna show you more the editorial side of things. So once we're, we're able to get over the hump of getting the variable font in there in the first place and starting to use it and then expand on our thinking as designers to use a broader range of it and not use just regular and bold, but kind of use 100 to 900 and everything in between, um, just right for the purpose. So we can tailor things based on small screen or large. Now, <clears throat> one of the other questions that people inevitably get is, well, if it's not supported everywhere, then I'm not gonna use it anywhere. Um, we don't have to do that. Web fonts are supported on 97 or 98% of the devices that are used on the web. Variable fonts are supported on about 91%. And by adding this little bit of CSS, where we use the static version of the font, and then at supports, if it, if it checks out that it can support font variation settings, that tells us that the browser understands variable fonts, so we just redefine the font family. And in many cases, that's kind of it. Um, so on a, a large sports website here in the US, the Bleacher Report Live site, um, I worked with an agency up in Halifax to implement variable fonts to do just that. And we replaced eight different static font files with two variable font files, reduced the amount of data being downloaded by about 350K per user. And we had that much more infinite range to devote to establishing that visual hierarchy. So even though we haven't gotten into changing the design that much, we still created a faster website experience by making sure that that 91% or so of those people are going to get the variable fonts instead of the static ones. So their pages are gonna load about half a second or more faster in some cases as much as two seconds, depending on the network condition. So it's a really big difference in how quickly we can get stuff on screen. Um, so uh, I mentioned the Bleacher Report Live. I showed you my website. Um, I wanted to mention georgia.gov uh, because this is an example where we used the web fonts, the, the variable fonts, excuse me, um, on a very large scale network. It's now in use in about 80 or so state agency websites across the state of Georgia um, to the tune of three to four million people a week are using this and experiencing um, this, uh, this typography where all of this stuff can scale and it's the same typeface that's rendering all of this text and then along with the weight and size as everything changes as we make the screen size smaller, we can change a lot of these values in a very fluid way. So we're able to scale 
the typography using some clever little bits of CSS to actually calculate the font size and line height with math based on the size of the screen. And then we can also tailor the weight and optical size or any other axis based on screen size as well. So that was a really interesting project that I've been working on uh, with them for about the past year and a half or so. And seeing that rolled out across such a large network really helped to me sort of underscore how production ready this stuff is. There's lots of fonts available now. You can get them from almost every font vendor. We'll have this, uh, some variable font versions. Pricing is a little all over the map, but that also opens up an opportunity now to talk to those foundries and see if they want a case study. Maybe you can work with them and showcase their work and do something really interesting with it um, and work out a, a, an agreement with them. Um, I'll go out on a limb and say, currently, I think the pricing model of you have to buy the whole family in order to get the variable font is not going to be sustainable. Um, it's not that I don't value fonts. I just don't think it's the right model. Um, but we're working on it. And when I see we, it's really just people are trying to figure it out. Um, I work with a lot of different type designers and foundries, um, give them some advice on some of these things and help showcase their, um, their offerings. The market hasn't quite figured this part out yet. Um, so we can support it in older browsers pretty easily. We can increase the, the performance so we can remove a lot of the barriers to adoption. Um, now we want to get to that editorial piece of this and really showcase how much we can do um, to make our designs more interesting now that we have all of this, this stuff at our, uh, at, at our uh, disposal. So uh, I mentioned the ad hoc website. Um, ad hoc is a, is a really interesting company here in the US that does a lot of government websites. So they maintain very large portions of healthcare.gov, um, the vets.gov website, and a bunch of other sort of large scale transactional things. And we wanted to make sure their website was really fast, worked really well in as many conditions as possible, but still gave them some design flexibility. So this is sort of a standard um, design for their blog post and content pages. We've got a large header that has a little bit um, wider margins for it, a lead paragraph style, this sort of byline area, and then the headings kind of stick out a little bit. And it's actually um, math that is a quarter of this available space. So we're just doing some interesting things with CSS to calculate these things on the fly. So as the screen size changes, that margin changes as well. Um, but if we go and take a look at what's available to them when they go to post a blog post, um, if they add one or two little bits of code um, in what's called the front matter of their blog post when they go to write one, they could get a title that looks a little bit like this. And, and so it's using the same font, just with a lighter weight and a larger size, and then a, a CSS shape that scales with the text. And so as we kind of move this in and out, you can see it reflows pretty nicely and still gives them a more interesting editorial design without sacrificing readability. And it takes them about five minutes extra during their publishing process to add in a few lines of CSS they can copy from a template. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what's going on there. Um, they're able to use the exact same tool that I'm gonna show you here. Um, so I'm in a browser. Everything I've been showing you has been uh, in HTML and CSS with live web fonts. This is in Firefox. That has a really great developer tool area where you have the normal rules here that apply and I've selected the H1. I'll move this out of the way. So the main level heading is right here you can see that it has a shape outside of a polygon. And so I, if I click on that, you can see it shows up here in a blue line with these little dots. And this is the one bit of code that they have to copy into the front matter template. They say they want the sort of fancy design um, option and they put in the shape outside code. They can actually just go in here and play around with it just by grabbing and moving these dots around. And then going back to this tool, that code has already updated. They can just copy it and paste it in. And so as long as it is using 
these viewport width units here, VW, for that X coordinate, then it will scale with the size of the window and it will scale with the text because the, scale, the text is scaling the same way. So um, it's simple combinations. It, yes, it does require a little bit of code, but it does allow them a tremendous amount of flexibility and a designer can be taught that amount of code pretty easily. Um, and they've got the design eye, so they understand that piece of it, teach them how to use the web browser tools and then copy this code in there. Um, a number of the designers on their team right out of the gate were able to, to customize blog posts this way. And it really gave them something that stands out from their competitors when anybody's looking at their blog. Not only are they tremendously competent technically, um, but creatively they're able to do some really interesting things too. Um, and it's all still regular text. It's very accessible. It doesn't impact screen readers at all. So it ticks all the boxes for technically how you want to build things for the web without compromising on aesthetics. Um, so uh, this is another site that I thought I would show you for um, just some editorial design possibilities in a, a little more understated way. Um, but again, this is one um, that I designed for the Google Fonts team um, as a, an explanation of variable fonts and how to implement them using the Google Fonts API. And uh, we took their material design system and married it with a variable version of Roboto that they were working on with David Burlow. And we have one that allows us to play around with the width, the slant, um, and the weight, and a few other things um, to, to do something where all of this text is with the same font. Um, so we're able to get all of this different variation in size and scale and weight and width um, to create a really a more interesting typographic system that has a tremendous amount of visual range without having to load any additional assets. Um, and this site is actually a variablefonts.io is a great resource for you to go and see what all of these things are, um, play around uh, with each of the different axes and see what the CSS looks like um, and learn how you can bring these things into your own site. Um, I showed you um, that georgia.gov site. Um, I wrote about that on my blog and then combined some of those techniques. So I used that CSS shape um, this is my, the same blog that I uh, use uh, to post all of my web typography news and all that other stuff. Um, I was able to just add one little block of, of code at the bottom of the post and get something that, and I'll show you how this, this actually scales pretty nicely. Um, you can see even as the screen gets smaller until it gets down to a tablet, on a phone it actually goes to a, a normal all the way across um, design just based on a media query, but overall it preserves that sort of slightly more editorial feel pretty nicely across a pretty broad range of screen sizes. Um, and uh, a few other experiments um, that I, I did for my newsletter and some of my talks last year, um, looking at a single blog post uh, with virtually unchanged underlying HTML, only some style changes. Um, this started out uh, as a blog post I wrote around um, an experience I had in college, actually, um, learning about how to communicate design. Um, so that's, that's the, the premise of the blog post. Um, but I wanted to show uh, a sort of somewhat standard, although slightly oversized, um, way of designing things these days. Medium, the New York Times, a lot of websites use this like big photos centered column of text, lots of white space. Uh, this is using Univer from Monotype. Uh, they gave me a bunch of variable fonts they were about to release to play around with. And this has a width and a weight axis as well as italics. So it, I thought it would make a good candidate to play around with. And that's the sort of standard approach. And I thought, well, what can we do by adding a few lines of CSS? Well, we could shift things around and actually take that same column width and we've done a little bit of math with the CSS to have the image fill whatever's left without changing the width of that text. So if I bring this page in, you'll notice the images scale long before the text does until I start to bring it in here. 
and the images go in line. So as long as it's wide enough for those images to be out there, they just fill that available space using math to subtract whatever's left from the width of the text column that I assigned. So this is the same HTML, so it could be the same stuff that came out of a content management system in WordPress or Squarespace or whatever else. And then a little bit of extra CSS allows us to kind of change the layout a little bit um, and put things off to the side and see the image and text next to each other. And then the idea would be to take that a little bit further. And you know, here's where, um, and this was originally inspired actually by a quote from, from Nina Stosinger um, that got me thinking about the nature of design and, and by extension typography being, being sometimes about pacing and not necessarily about readability. And, and I spend a lot of time on the web focusing on typography for readability without stopping to think about typography for attention. And, and so that's where you get this push and pull where sometimes you want the type to be harder to read. You want people to have to stop and think. So rotating text on its side just gets people to pause for a moment and, and actually think about what it is you put up on the screen. They'll still figure it out. You know, this is a very big screen that I have this stretched on right now, but if this was a little bit more uh, sort of like, uh, you know, what, what you see on most of your laptops or something like that, you might see something like this. Well, chances are people will still figure out that that says design is communication. It's not that hard, but it does get them to slow down a little bit and think about it. And then when we get down below, you can see it's a lot of similar stuff, but um, we did some, some things like style the first line because that's an easy thing you can do in CSS. Um, we can style the lead paragraph a little bit differently by selecting the first paragraph in a series. And then we can use some math again to fit the images in the sidebar and let those things scale together. All of those things were a lot of fun. It creates a little bit of variation, but it doesn't really take things dramatically in a different direction. And I think this is where we are on the web is we need to take things dramatically further than what we have been doing because uh, the state of the state of the art in web design is often still um, very fine degrees of gray. Um, it's it's just not uh, a lot of it's just not all that interesting because we've been chasing after the system in order to publish content over and over and over again every you know, many many times a day without building in the idea of getting design back in that process of publishing. So. This is that same blog post with an extra 50 lines of CSS. So we've done a few additional things here that are all, again, still standard things you can do on the web. There's nothing really particularly fancy here. We have text overlaying an image in the background, and we've told the browser that we can break the text anywhere we want, but we want it contained in that area where we have the photo. So as that scales, you can see that it'll break differently. But again, people are still gonna figure that out. It's not that difficult. It's a pretty common technique in print design. Um, there's no reason we can't bring that to the web. Um, again, we styled the first paragraph a little bit differently. Um, I picked a color out of the photo and I used that as an accent. We can kind of echo that throughout. Again, something you could build into WordPress themes or, or Drupal themes or whatever um, pretty easily. So we've got the lead paragraph styled one way. We've got a drop cap in here that works really nicely across browser. We're using multiple columns in CSS. That you want to do with shorter blocks of text because you don't want people to have to scroll up and down, but it is something that is very responsive. So as we go from a wider screen to a slightly narrower one, if I can grab that corner, you'll notice that it goes from four to three to two down to a single column, and that's three lines of CSS. So there's a lot of things that can be done uh, to create that more interesting effect. Maybe it's just for a couple paragraphs you select that style. So it could go from one column to two back to one again as you're publishing a blog post. Um, you could start to create a little bit more visual interest as you go. 
And instead of things being the once in a blue moon snowfall piece on the New York Times website, they could have more interesting layout and design all, all day, every day. Um, you know, they could bring that art direction and that design back into the publishing process um, much more readily. Now, I'm vastly oversimplifying the New York Times publishing process, but the fact remains it's possible. And, and that's what we want to be thinking about as designers is to, once we understand things that can be done, we want to start to do them more and push it uh, because then the browsers will look at it and say, hey, people are using these, uh, these, these features. We should enhance them or support them better. Um, the browser vendors are really good about that. Uh, so that's a large part of what I do with my newsletter. Um, there are a lot of browser engineers that read it. Um, so I write about web typography, uh, just sent out another one this morning. And um, I get a lot of feedback from that, from browser vendors saying, hey, I didn't know this didn't work. Can you comment on that? Can you give me a test case for it? Um, it's resulted in a lot of bugs being sorted out or at least identified. Um, and it, it really does create a much better conversation with the technology world based on what we could use in design. Um, and I have one more variation from this that I wanted to show you um, that I, I kind of revisited I threw this together um, for a conference talk earlier this year, and then I kind of forgot to bring it back into the collection of the rest of them. And I just, I kind of love this one. Um, I, I really like the way uh, we can think through this different rhythm of line height and, and interplay. So it's using a combination of these techniques of the CSS shape around these words. They scale together really nicely. Um, the text has a, a a math calculation for the line height that fits with this changing size of this text. Um, and it, it does create a really interesting interplay, again, without changing any of the underlying HTML and CSS. You know, it, it scales weirdly because I didn't finish designing the stuff for the small end, but it does kind of show the possible with this. Um, and, and for many of these breakpoints, I could just shift it back to one column pretty easily um, uh, to address some of those weird corners, but um, it does make for a much more sort of interesting experience. Um, so I have been showing you lots of stuff. Um, I haven't seen any questions come in yet, but um, I'm going to show you two other projects and then I'd like to just answer questions for the rest of the time. Um, so we've covered a lot about what variable fonts are um, they, uh, and, and how well they're supported and some different ways we can use them. And then once we are using them, um, showing you how much we might be able to stretch our voice um, as designers to use the typefaces in a little bit uh, more expansive way. Um, but I wanted to come back to more considered typography uh, because ultimately, a lot of what the web is about is reading. And, and while that's not the only thing, um, I do think it does form a lot of the basis of what we want to be thinking about. And so um, what I've been working on in my newsletter is typesetting Moby Dick. And, and so uh, we've, uh, there have been like seven parts to the newsletter so far. and We've been taking it from raw HTML um, into something that is more and more refined and exploring a little different ways of, um, of browsing and, and reading that text. Before I show you that, um, I want to show you something else that I, I sort of split off from that um, a few weeks ago. And, and today was the first time that I ever really publicized that, um, that this existed. Now, I'm, I'm a white male, so I'm not really the best person to talk about racism, um, but it's certainly not something that can be that far from our minds here in the US. And, and so um, in the days after George Floyd's murder, um, I wanted to try and learn a little bit more about what I don't know. And, and one of the things that I wanted to do um, was read more and educate myself a little bit. And so, uh, I wanted to read a little bit more of MLK's writing and letter from Birmingham jail was uh, really kind of seemed the right place to start. And so I couldn't find an interesting copy, uh, a nicely formatted copy available online anywhere. So I found the text and I decided to see 
how well does this framework that I've been working on work to typeset something nicely and, um, and create something that would be a, a nicer experience for me to read and then um, if it came out well, then just kind of put it out there for anybody else to experience as well. Um, so, uh, so that's what I did. And, um, and what I decided to end up doing was, uh, was typeset it and add in as many of these sort of finishing touches as I could. So um, we've, we've got the scaling text size that works nicely to be sort of appropriately sized for the screen size. So on smaller screens, I'm just trying to let this catch up a little bit. There we go. Um, the text size scales fluidly from one size, uh, a smaller size to a larger one based on the screen. Um, I also have a few things going on here to scale some of these other elements, but also address things like orphans. So you'll note as you scroll down, there's, there's never a single word at the end of a paragraph. There's always at least two. Um, so there's a little bit of JavaScript that I added in there from Nathan Ford that helps address that across a paragraph level. It will actually adjust the padding on each of these paragraphs. Um, I'll only use hyphenation on the smallest screens to create an, a nicer reading experience there. Um, all of these things are kind of factored in. Um, there's also some kind of pull quote styles that go from either inline um, or kind of off to the side as, as the screen gets big enough. I have to excuse the redraw delay. I think I'm trying to do too many things at once here. Um, let me let this catch up here. There we go. Um, and you'll also notice what we've got italics and discretionary ligatures that have been enabled only for the pull quotes and the titles rather than having um, those ligatures appear everywhere else in the text. And um, so I've tried to bring all of the different typographic techniques, better quotation marks, uh, proper quotation marks, um, section marks automatically when you add a horizontal rule in, um, capital, you know, sort of typesetting the first line of the next section automatically. Um, all of those little things come in here. Um, I've also, on this one as well, um, set it up so that if you enable uh, dark mode on, uh, on your screen, that it will also automatically invert the, um, uh, the text as well. Um, so you can also choose to have it be light or dark. Um, it changes the weight of the text a little bit as you, uh, as you flip from one contrast level to the other so that it optically will look kind of the same. Um, it also is something that you can on your phone save to your home screen and actually read offline. Um, so there's a lot of technical things as well as typographic things that we can work together in a single interface um, to create interesting and, and more polished reading experiences on the web, um, in addition to all of the, the flash stuff. So I wanted to make sure that we didn't lose sight of just, just what is a, a good interpretation of, of typography um, on the web uh, compared to what we might do in print. And uh, now the last thing that I wanted to show you before we switch to Q&A is what I've been doing with Moby Dick. So um, the design overall of the interface is still something that's developing, but um, we have, again, it's, it's just using Literata. So that's the only typeface that we're using throughout. And then uh, as you go into other chapters, we've got some beautiful Rockwell Kent illustrations in here, um, but it is also typeset in the same fashion. Um, so it's making sure there's no orphans. It's um, it's using a longer form reading style. So we're just indenting the, the following paragraphs instead of spacing them. Excuse me. Um, so it's all geared towards longer form reading, but it also allows you to choose how you would like to experience it. So it created another way of experiencing it that actually swipes across. And, and so especially on a phone or a tablet, this is a nice touch-based way of experiencing the text. And where the browser supports it, you'll actually see some other widow and orphan stuff. So if we were looking at this in Safari, you'd never see this one line from the last paragraph on the top of the page. There's CSS to support controlling that. It will make sure there's at least two lines at the top or the bottom. So there's a lot of nice little touches that might not work 
a hundred percent of the time, but it's supported more and more as we bring these things uh, in place. And it allows us to experience the web and experience reading in a form factor that's suitable to us. And that's the thing that I, I wanted to stress there um, is that not only can we do all of these things on behalf of our clients and for ourselves to expand our vocal range and make things far more interesting, we can at the same time make it more accessible to the reader and allow them to choose the format that is most suitable to them. Uh, if they have a light sensitivity, they'll want dark mode. Um, if they have aging eyes like mine, they need higher contrast. Um, if they uh, suffer from crowding, which is a, a sort of a, an additional uh, condition that some people with dyslexia suffer from, spacing out lines and words increases reading comprehension dramatically. So giving those controls to the reader by using this really flexible typographic system allows them to experience and read and enjoy that content more and more. Um, so I think that's what um, I think is really um, the most important takeaway for, for, uh, for me that I hope you'll walk away from this with is we, we can do a lot more and it's very important that we embrace not only better typography overall, but better flexible typography to allow a greater variety of readers to take in that content in a more comfortable way and, and know that the technology is there to support it. Um, you might not know all of the code. Uh, chances are I've got it someplace for free where you can grab it and, and pass it along to somebody who can. Um, my newsletter is all open. All the, all the code is open source. I've got tons of stuff on CodePen and various other places, um, some online courses, uh, tons of examples. Um, so if you're not sure how to implement something, you can just get in touch. And um, I'm more than happy to, um, to, to fill you in and, and point you in the right direction. So I think um, light and dark mode we talked about. Um, places to find variable fonts. I don't want to gloss over that. Um, V-fonts.com is Nick Sherman's sort of catalog site of variable fonts. Um, Google Fonts now has it in their UI. You can check a box to see which fonts they have are available as variable fonts. Um, you'll probably need a little bit of help from variablefonts.io to implement it. It does take a little bit of fiddling to, um, to get the full range of the variable font when you're calling it from their service. Um, My Fonts is now selling variable fonts as well. Um, DJR's Font of the Month Club is amazing. Um, it averages out to about $6 a month and he ships you all kinds of great stuff all year long. And most of the things that he ships include a variable version. Um, and, and the Twitter and GitHub links that I have here, when you can get to the slides, actually will take you to a search for variable font related things. And you'll be able to find lots of resources and fonts to download and play with there as well. Um, and finally, um, some links to other website tools um, that will help you experiment with variable fonts. These videos will teach you about the Firefox dev tools that I just showed you. Um, and a couple other websites that will help you inspect variable fonts and figure out what they do. And um, some more tutorial stuff, um, more things to read about Google Fonts API. Again, I will get this stuff posted today and, and make sure that Carrie has the, the link to send out to everybody um, so that you can come back to these uh, when you have time and um, read about more of this stuff and find more code examples and, and things like that. And thank you very much. We'll kind of leave it at that and, and let it take some time for, uh, for questions. Okay. Um, do you have the questions panel in front of you, Jason? Or I do, I do. All right, I'm, go ahead and take them. Or sure. So, um, so uh, thank you, Todd. Um, the light and dark mode. Um, so um, I actually detailed a lot more about that in the newsletter that went out today. So actually, if you go to rwt.io to my website and look under tips, thankfully I got this published here about 20 minutes before we started. Um, this has much, so the, the, the reader's right, preferences and light, light mode, um, that has tons of resources. The short answer is what I will typically do when you go to dark mode is either 
if there's a grade axis, which is really useful, um, it alters the weight of the text without the heart changing the horizontal metrics. Um, that will allow you to lower the weight a little bit without changing the overall spacing um, because typically when you have white text on a dark background, it will look heavier than the reverse. So as you switch to dark mode, um, your, your text will tend to fatten up a little bit. Um, and that's one of those things that actually has changed over time with coarser resolution screens. Sometimes it had the opposite effect, but in today's world with higher resolution monitors and phone screens, you will tend to want to reduce the weight. I will also open up the letter spacing a little bit. So that way you separate the characters just a tiny bit more. And it's a very small amount, but if you take a look, um, if we go here, um, and I will flip the contrast on that. And if I inspect this paragraph, if we look at these styles, so um, where, it, where it's in dark mode, so it doesn't have a light class added to it, um, and it also has the media query. So that's the combination of things. Somebody has put it in dark mode, and they have not forced it to a light color theme. It lowers the weight from 385 to 350, and it changes the letter spacing from the default to it adding 0.0015M. It's a very, very small amount that you'd think a browser couldn't render, but watch what happens when I turn it on and off. See how everything reflows a lot? Mm -hmm. We can minimize that reflow if we even the weight and the letter spacing at the same time. So when we change both of those things, we make it more readable, but we minimize the reflow as you go back and forth. So, um, so that's why I try and do those things in tandem. If you have a grade axis, sometimes you can just play with that. Um, it's not super common yet, but um, Google has definitely pushed for that in a lot of the fonts that they've been commissioning. So hopefully we'll see it more and more. I think the grade axis is, uh, is, is really useful. Um, so, um, so that's that's what I will typically do when I'm enabling a dark mode is is try and tweak those values just a little bit. So um, I hope that that answers it for you. Um, uh, you have a new question up here. Yep. Uh, so are there any uh, current formal rules for web font design? How many style variations or to question of feel? So um, it is the wild west. Um, so generally <laughs> speaking. Um, well, it's still very much a split with type designers who think it's worthwhile and, and many who don't. Uh, the whole format itself, the variable format. Um, the most common one you see um, is a weight axis because that tends to be what most people are designing first. Um, so the, the common ones you might see are um, italics, or possibly slant or both. Sometimes people will separate those things. Sometimes they won't. Um, and weight axis width is probably the next most common uh, because that's another one of those things that people tend to design for. Um, the tricky thing is as you are going and letting the browser interpolate between a narrow and a wide and a, a thick and a thin, you will find some odd corners in that design space. And so the typeface designers will make decisions based on the design where it's working successfully and where it isn't. And that will typically be the guide for what they, what they release. Um, the more axes, the larger the file. So that also is something to keep in mind. You can use variable fonts in recent versions of Corel Draw, Sketch, Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. Uh, so there are a number of print applications that will let you use variable fonts to their fullest extent, um, but they don't work that well. Um, so it really is um, a question of, of what does the design lend itself to and what are they curious about and what have they found um, a, a market for? Um, so Literata with optical size and weight, uh, that was a perfect pairing for a text face. So that's why they focused on adding the optical size axis with this latest iteration of, of the typeface. I mean, it really extends the, the usefulness of that typeface from a small range of weights, 400 to 700. It now goes, I think, 200 to 900. 
and the optical size axis. So um, it really will vary. Uh, and that's where exploring the VFONTS website is kind of fun. You'll see all the different axes that are available for all these different typefaces and you can kind of play with them a little bit. Um, so at the moment, it's kind of up to us. The more we ask for, the more type designers will understand there's a market for these things. And if we start to gravitate for ty to typefaces that offer them, um, then that's what people will spend their energy on. Okay. We have any other any other questions or any any anything people want to see me explain a little bit more? I mean, we still have a few more minutes. I'm happy to keep talking. Um, barring any other questions, um, you can always find me on on Twitter at J Pomentel J P A M E N T A L, um, Instagram for photos of the dogs. And if you go to rwt.io um, slash newsletter, you can sign up for my web typography newsletter, which is generally weekly. I um, had a little bit of a break based on uh, current events here in the U.S. over the past month. But, um, oh, <laughs> yes. Um, oh, so let me, let me finish that thought. Sorry. So, uh, the newsletter will focus on uh, different bits of web typography, know-how, uh, and examples, code, and and resources every every issue. And the whole archive is on my website under the tips section. So there's lots and lots there. We're up to issue number 48. And um, the, uh, the resource from Nathan Ford, um, I think I pointed out in this issue, let me just get down to the resources at the end. Um, nope, I didn't. I will, I will send a link to that. But if you search Nathan, Nathan Ford, um, I think it was called like typography adjust. Um, it's, it's available on GitHub. Um, or if you take a look at, um, at what I have in here, uh, in the Moby Dick repository or the letters from jail one, um, all that stuff is, is available there as well. It was really easy to implement. The one thing that you have to watch out for is on a really long page, like the letter from jail, um, that's, I think, approaching the limit that you would want to use this for. Um, because the longer the page, the more it's re-rendering things. Um, so you start to run into some browser problems. But um, at this length, it's still working really nicely. Even on phones, um, it still loads things up really well and it looks beautiful. Okay, well, I guess if there aren't any other questions, then uh, maybe we'll give you two minutes of your day back. <laughs> or I'll turn it back over to Carrie if you have anything else you want to add about the recording or anything. No, no, I think um, that was wonderful, Jason. Thank you. And thank you for, for providing all these resources as well. Um, I can see that, you know, quite a, quite a few people have written in to say thank you for all of that. <clears throat> so I guess, yeah, maybe we'll give everybody two minutes of their day back. Sure. There was one last question about layouts. Um, I do talk about that from time to time in the newsletter, just getting into some of the things I've been showing you. Um, but if you have any other specific questions uh, or are interested in, in some of these other uh, bits and pieces, uh, find me on Twitter. I can point you to different conference talks where I've, I've covered that in greater detail with video and slides and all that sort of thing. I'd be happy to share. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. So long. Bye-bye.